death ships from Al Kahara. Lorak 1 sat on the pad close to the mining camp on Gentleman's Dig, a small but productive group of asteroids in the Menkalinan fields. She had arrived from Alpha Centauri two days ago with a relief crew, who had spent most of the voyage gloomily contemplating the prospect of their 18-month tour of duty in this rather dismal place. As she refueled and provisioned for the return trip, the men who had jubilantly watched her arrival were happily completing the handover to their replacements and gathering their belongings together for the journey back to the playgrounds of the Centauri system. The boisterous chatter was almost entirely concerned with how many credits were due to them and the relative merits of some of the more dubious entertainments awaiting them. Eventually, the ship was ready for liftoff, and they trooped noisily aboard, watched by the subdued group they were leaving behind. The anti-grav generator's whine climbed into the inaudible, and first the base, then the rocky cluster dwindled into specks beneath them. The warp drive coordinates were keyed in, the flight computer activated, and the craft began to melt into hyperspace. It was a chance in ten million that an unscheduled ore freighter en route for Gentleman's Dig emerged from warp at the precise instant that Lorak-1 entered it. The warp field generated around a ship entering hyperspace is not confined to the outer surface of the hull, but extends some distance beyond it. The reason why vessels have to move under conventional power to specify jump zones is to ensure that no other objects are inadvertently drawn into warp with the ship. The extraordinary coincidence experienced by Lorak-1 nearly ended the voyage before it had really begun. She bucked and spun crazily as her field struggled to draw the ore freighter into warp as well, and the nuclear plant and generators climbed dangerously near to overload. But the combined mass was too great and after a frenzied instant, Lorak-1 slipped into hyperspace, leaving the skipper of the freighter to bring his own vessel back under control. The experience must have been a startling one for him, as his detectors would not have had a chance to pick up the outgoing craft at the instant of emerging from warp, so he would have had no idea of what had suddenly hurled him around apparently empty space. Three months later, a traffic control beacon near Centauri registered the scheduled arrival of the returning relief ship and transmitted a routine check signal, but there was no answer from the stationary vessel hanging within sight of its destination. The signal was repeated on a number of frequencies to no avail, so central control was notified and a scout ship was dispatched to investigate. It was not long before Lorak-1 was visible through the viewports of the little craft, and its crew anxiously examined the growing image for any signs of damage. Her hull appeared intact, and lights could be seen glowing from the ports scattered along the irregular hull, including the larger ones in the vicinity of the main control deck, but there were no other signs of any living presence aboard. With a sense of foreboding, two of the crew began to clamber into their bulky suits as the scout ship approached the silent shape of the larger vessel while another broke out the laser gear and pressure seals so that an entry could be forced if necessary. Within seconds, the hull of Lorak-1 was looming over them, and the captain eased the ship towards the greenish light of the control cabin above. Suddenly, he gasped with astonishment as the small craft drew level with the huge viewports. The entire cabin was filled with a dense, fungus-like growth, which seemed to emit a dull glow of its own. Puzzled, he moved his ship further down the outer skin to one of the smaller viewports, but there the same sight met his eyes. His sensors indicated that practically every square inch of compartment space registered the same density as the control cabin, in addition to which a high internal radiation level was detected. He ordered the two men to exchange their suits for heavier radiation-proof ones before they disappeared into the airlock, reappearing in the viewport as they set up the isolation seal around themselves. Soon the tiny bubble glowed eerily as they cut their way into the skin of the ship. The situation became clear as they hacked their way through the strange growth in search of the men who had occupied her. The radiation was traced to a major reactor leak obviously caused by the sudden and powerful load imposed on Jump Off. The intense emission had curiously mutated some of the plants in the hydroponic banks as well as killing the unfortunate passengers, and the unchecked growth had spread throughout the vessel.